And um, the, call, the talk today is going to be um, a paper called Rinocchio, SNARKs for Ring Arithmetic, uh, which we found, it was found very interesting um, as an innovative paper in, in, in the program committee. Uh, the authors are uh, Chaya Ganesh, Anka Nitulescu, and Eduardo Soria Vazquez. And Anka is going to be presenting today. Um, so Anka, uh, please share your screen and feel free to take on. Yes. You have 20 minutes for the presentation. Um, do you all see my screen? Just to make sure. Great. Thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, can you see my pointer too? Uh, I hope yes, I don't see you anymore. Uh, yes. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, then yeah, I, I, I'm trying to make this talk uh, friendly with uh, the venue. So focusing on what are the important uh, building blocks in SNARKs and why we will like to take into account the possibility to move everything pro to ring arithmetics uh, rather than fields if we have this uh, standardization process already in place for fields. So yeah, I, uh, I will uh, just uh, state the, the plan for, for my talk today. Um, I will start with generalities about SNARKs and how the, some framework that fits somehow any known construction of uh, pre-processing uh, secret dependent SNARKs. So um, it's, uh, it's another class of SNARK construction not the updatable or universal secret ones. Um, also, I, I will dive a little bit into the challenges for moving this framework and generalizing in order to work for rings that are not fields and uh, yeah, what, uh, what are the costs there and the overheads and uh, the, the important technical uh, details. So what are SNARKs? Are SNARKs in non-interactive arguments of knowledge? I don't think they need more presentation than this. So uh, we have the actors here, a prover, uh, Pinocchio, which is uh, untrusted, uh, and a verifier that uh, wants to check if some statement is true. Um, so the prover will, will be able to convince the verifier by just uh, sending the, the statement together with the proof attached to it. Um, what we will need as key properties for SNARKs, uh, that the proof should not depend on the uh, complexity of computing the solution, like uh, of a statement. Um, they should be non-interactive. We should uh, not require the prover and the, the verifier to have uh, any exchange of messages. And uh, they should have some strong soundness, which is called knowledge soundness, um, that captures the, the property of, um, of a prover who really knows a solution when uh, claims some statement. So we want the prover to know the witness used in order to compute a, a valid instance. Great. So the most common use case is um, like outsourcing computation. We have the verifier, which is uh, outsourcing some complicated task to a prover. Uh, which will uh, do the do the work, so compute some function, and then get back to with the result together with the uh, convincing proof. And of course, we should uh, um, ensure that no cheating proof, no uh, uh, false statement will uh, will pass the verification check. Uh, another important aspect that uh, divides the the the, the possible SNARK construction is are the two flavors, uh, publicly and designated verifier. So in a publicly verifi verifiable stack, we have uh, any anybody in the universe has the possibility using some public knowledge, some public uh, setting and the proof to check if, this, uh, if the statement is correct or not. Uh, in the designated verifier one, the proof is intended, intended to uh, a single verifier which has some secret uh, information in order to verify it. So the others will, will not, not be able to do it. Uh, also to um, just mention of a few uh, small selection of snarks that, uh, that fit the framework I, I will present today. So um, all of them are uh, pre-processing snarks. They, they are based in a, um, a, a structure uh, common reference string. And uh, this common reference thing is 
is um, circuit dependent. So it's not an universal stuff, uh, just to make sure. And um, we, we choose as a departing point for our construction, for our uh, um, uh, ring um, instantiation of SNAG, uh, this work by Pino uh, this work by uh, uh, Parano and all, uh, Pinocchio, which is the first efficient SNAG um, that is using some, uh, in the plane model, using some non-falsifiable assumption. And we don't opt out for this more more recent and considered the state of the art, the celebrated uh, GERD 16, because this is in a very idealized uh, model, which it's something a little more abstract uh, to reason about. So for the first construction to move from fields to the rings, uh, I think we, we keep it like uh, simple and uh, straightforward from some, some assumptions. Um, so the methodology. Uh, by the way, what did ECHR um, stand for? Uh, extractable uh, collision resistant hash functions. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the methodology for uh, constructing snags, it's uh, as I said, starting from a computation, then um, representing it in a in a nicer way, like a snarkly friend way, what I call this a nicer way, using polynomials. So we will represent it as a polynomial problem, like quadratic arithmetic programs or span square programs. And then um, the solution to this polynomial problem will be a polynomial, which it's easy to make succinct because we will evaluate it in a hidden point. And in order to hide this point and to ensure that the, the prover uh, uh, is not cheating and we have soundness, we need some uh, assumption on this hiding strategy, which are the encodings. I will call the encoding the hiding. So we have arithmetic circuit satisfactory uh, ability problem, which um, leads to quadratic arithmetic or square, uh, square arithmetic programs uh, and is based on different uh, kind of uh, assumption or, gener uh, or model. Uh, we have also Boolean circuits, uh, which even if they are in uh, in the binary uh, field here, like uh, lead to some uh, quadratic or spare, uh, square span program, which is also over a prime order um, uh, field. And um, we don't have anything more generic than this. Everything will require to all the, the known SNARK and the state of the art construction required to, to move computation into a circuit over a field. So to express it with addition and multiplication over a field. Uh, where uh, this uh, like ZP, where P is the 254 bit prime, uh, like uh, the most common choice in the implementations. So the problem is like, if we have a circuit of a ring, or as many computation may be, like Z to the K or RSA group, which is not uh, into a field, then we will have to translate this, this operation in the ring into field operations. And uh, that will require some overhead. So I, I give here two examples. Um, here for the two to the K, Z to the K, we need to make a modular reduction, modulo two to the K, and this uh, is called bit decomposition, which has a cost m plus one uh, multiplication, where um, m is the uh, log of x max, which is the um, expected maximum value that x will uh, will take. Uh, also, the RSA uh, transformation into the field uh, requires to split the RSA uh, ring or elements into multiple. Uh, pieces we will call them words, and each multiplication in the in the ring will translate into the field into this number of multiplications, in in where m is the number of parts we split. Great. So we are not really happy. We have good snarks that work perfectly over fields, but can we do it better? Right. So this is the, the problem we address in this work. And um, we, we built a framework that addresses how to construct snarks, starting with computation that are over rings and like uh, building the complete representation as a, a polynomial program. And then uh, 
finding the good assumption and the good encodings in order to instantiate this into a snack. Um, so our contribution for short is like, uh, we like Pinocchio, Pinocchio is a nice construction, but it's only for the fence. So we put a ring, a ring on it and uh, we get Pinocchio. Um, and why do we care? I want a little bit uh, to motivate this, this work. Um, a lot of computation are um, naturally inherited in, in, in these uh, rings that are not fields. So Pinocchio, it's, it's a little bit uh, overwhelmed by this computation, but we have Pinocchio to the rescue and we will uh, send solve all, all our integrity problems in these words. Great. So now I'm making a step back and I'm trying to decompose snark construction into building blocks into pieces into important pieces and uh, like a pipe pipeline and uh, methodology so let's let's see uh, how those proofs work in general and what's common to all of them and how we can build a framework that is as gener general as we I will, as we could uh, so from a NP statement uh, computation, we can compile this to uh, a circuit, ignore what type of circuit for now. And from the circuit, we need to find an equivalent problem, this polynomial problem, um, such that finding a solution to this problem, it's equivalent to knowing a set of uh, satisfying assignments to the circuit. Great, once we have this, uh, Pinocchio now, we'll just have to show to the verifier a uh, solution to the polynomial problem. So which is usually a polynomial or a set of polynomials. This is a toy example, like take it as didactically um, helpful. So now the, the problem is that sending polynomials, coefficient of polynomials is as, as long as sending the entire witness for a computation. So we, do, we need to do something smarter and we will just evaluate this in a point and this point should not be available to the prover, so it should not be adversarial cho chosen. So it should be like fixed somewhere and hidden from the prover. So the prover has no control on this point. So this is where we will use these encoding schemes. And this is why this kind of construction are always uh, uh, CRS uh, based. Like we will have this hidden point somewhere in the sky, fixed by in the CRS. And then the prover will have uh, a method to, to homomorphically compute the encoding of this. So here it should be another envelope. In the, it should be in the encoding. Yeah. So um, what what we what all the construction use they they use actually linearly homomorphic encodings. And because of this, because we have to compute evaluation of polynomials of degree d. We need to provide to the prover all the all the powers up to d of this hidden point, use the homomorphic uh, property of the encoding, and have the encoding of the polynomial evaluated in this. Great. Also, for the verifier to check some properties, some some quadratic equation on polynomials on on encodings that it receives or computes, um, we will need this kind of quadratic root det detection. Uh, uh, property, which means uh, I am able to tell that this equation here, which is a quadratic one, holds over encodings without necessarily doing something special with encodings. Yeah. And image verification is this a valid encoding of something. So these are the key properties that are common to, to all the scheme that we know, uh, like I'm aware of uh, uh, today. And uh, this is why I separated them for today's talk and we will focus on, on this. So representation for, for the circuit satisfiability problem into polynomial problem, and then uh, a suitable encoding scheme that satisfies certain properties. So the quadratic arithmetic program, which is the, the one used by Pinocchio in the fields, um, it's, it's defined like this. It, it's too like too much to, to pass for, for this talk. I will just focus on, on the essential part. So uh, given some sets of initial polynomials and a target polynomial, we should to come up with some other polynomials that satisfy some divisibility property with respect to this target polynomial. So this polynomial here on the right is the solution somehow like 
pieces of it, each of them, as a solution to this quadratic arithmetic problem. And this should be satisfied and verified in the verification equation. And where the, the witness plays a role here, so the assignments to the circuit actually are, are uh, the AIs that are used by the prover in order to, to create the solution, to compute a solution to this QAP. So somebody who is able to compute a solution to the QAP will know the, the valid assignment for the secret and the other way around. So we will not care at this point where those, those AI came from. We will be convinced that the prover knows the witness. Um, I will skip this part because I don't have time. I had uh, some example of how we really built QAPs from uh, R1 CS or from circuit directly. Uh, but let's focus on, on the next step. So I've said, once the prover has a polynomial with a property, like here I, I, I wrote P of X for all, all the right stuff here, and T of X the target polynomial, uh, then we will just evaluate in a point and we will convince like that the, the verifier that everything uh, holds for the polynomials themselves. So not only for the evaluation. And this is um, due to the schwarz zipper lemma, which says that the probability that things things uh, hold on the on on some random scalars, but they don't hold for the entire polynomials is uh, is negligible. Great. So next step is how do we hide that point where we want to evaluate the polynomials? So in in the field uh, case, we will use the bilinear groups, which are uh, this uh, these groups where discrete log is considered hard. And uh, we will hide things in the exponent. So these are prime order groups. So everything that is an exponent here, it's, it's modulo p, where p is a prime. So it's in the field. We cannot go more than, than doing things for over, over s's that are in the field. And also the coefficients here for a linear combination we, we, we make in order to compute an encoding of the polynomial evaluation, uh, the pi's should be in the field. Okay, so everything it's nice, but it's only for the field. Let's generalize this for uh, like any space, let's say. So we what we really need to, to have is to encode something with a public key or with a secret key, depends, uh, into some encode C, encoded value C. And uh, then we should ask this encoding to be linearly homomorphic and to hide the information we have. Great. For the quadratic root detection, the second important property for the uh, for the encodings in the bilinear group uh, world, we have pairings. So for the fields, we will use these pairings that check quadratic uh, equation over exponents, which are exactly the the encoded values. So uh, we we can do this publicly. Nothing else is demanded by just by knowing the description of a bilinear map. In the designated verifiable uh, generic, no, in the generic encoding uh, space, we need to be designated verifiable because, or, or not, but like we define it as having a secret key for the quadratic root detection. But if the secret key is something public, like here, the encoding, we, we fall into this first case. But Unfortunately, for more generic instantiation for over rings or over complicated uh, spaces, we will not have this nice structure and exponent uh, in, uh, encoding. Uh, some other assumptions that are needed for soundness and for knowledge soundness uh, are uh, DPKE, which is uh, also a discrete log type of assumption, which is non falsifiable, and ask the prover to du duplicate. Uh, like computer linear combination of uh, a set of uh, encoded values, but also with respect to a factor alpha, which is hidden. So if a prover is able to come up with this consistent two encodings, one is alpha times the, the other value, uh, then it should be the case that it computed them from applying the same linear combination on these first two sets here available as input. Uh, this is for the knowledge, so we can extract back the coefficient of a polynomial once you give me the just the evaluation of the polynomial. And then we have DPDH, um, which is um, power DPA Elman assumption, uh, where we 
consider it difficult for, uh, for approval to find this missing power, uh, the hidden missing power of S. Right. Uh, so now let's try to, if we remember all these pieces, let's try to see how we move them also to the ring uh, setting and how they still work there. Just a so, quick note, Tanka, I, yes. uh, you have um, a bit less than five minutes, so it would be bad, like, best to keep it in five minutes. Okay, I'm trying that. Like, yeah. uh, I'll rush a little bit, but we want to to make a framework for, for uh, rings, so, so we will start with uh, the representation the most uh, the first important block which is the quadratic ring program i'll skip this um so what was important here is to come up with a polynomial which is a special and another polynomial t such that if we find a polynomial p of x that in some random points evaluates to zero then we know that the this, the computation was done correctly over the rings and we try to extract what's the essential property uh, for this to hold. So the essential property is that this polynomial P of X uh, here on the right should be taken modulo T of X and this should be zero. So we should look at this space uh, I of X over uh, uh, modulo T of X, uh, all the polynomials uh, in the ring modulo T of X and this should be isomorphic with uh, this, this other, other modules. And because of that, Having this uh, P of X evaluated in each RIs equals zero, which is the what the constraint system asks us, uh, it's equivalent to finding a polynomial P of X such that it satisfies this property. So this will be the other, the other, the both way because of the isomorphism. And of course, if we are in a field, everything happens as expected because we don't even know have to, to write this very mathematical representation because all the ideas defined like that are co-primes uh, uh, between each other. So in the ring, we need to, to go further into, into these details and uh, to, to make it happen, to make all this idea co-prime, we need to find the uh, R, the, the, the interpolation points, the R, I, in an exceptional set, this set with G's here. What is an exceptional set is just a set. It doesn't have any algebraic structure, but it has the property that any difference between two elements, it's an unit in the ring, a unit like uh, it's invertible in the ring. Okay, so given this, this exceptional set, if we pick all our randomness here, everything happens as expected, as expected because this will cancel out and uh, this, is, this idea is co-prime. Um, okay, so we have the expected properties. Our friends are here for the rescue. And um, also for the Zweizipper lemma, there is an equivalent for the rings that uses the same exceptional set uh, instead of the field before. So we don't look to the all the ring, we look to this exceptional set that it's very important in, the, in, the, in this setting. And for the encodings, uh, so for the encodings, I said there are two assumptions in the field. Uh, let's see them in the ring, in the ring same. We will give encodings, as I said, this uh, encodings, we will ask the, the prover to duplicate its effort with respect to some alpha, which is hidden. And this is a correct assumption. It's as, as, uh, as uh, intuitive as the other. Um, but for the PDH assumption, we have some, some small modification to do because it can happen uh, like this, using just this one, will not help us to prove soundness of our scheme in the ring. So it happens that the prover will be able to come up with the encoding of some constant, some ring element times the, the missing power of S, but, and it knows this constant, but since we are in the ring, the, this constant is not inver invertible. So we cannot just uh, extract straightforward the encoding of the missing value as we would have done in the in the fields. So the, the generalization of this assumption is to ask for a successful uh, adversary to come up with some value A, which is not zero, of course, and the encoding of A times the missing power. So this uh, changes a little bit. And in, in the field, this makes no difference because one, one uh, adversary, that, uh, um, adversary that knows A knows also the, 
the inverse in a field for A, it always exists. So it can just uh, cancel it out here by using linearly homomorphic property for the encodings. So yeah, this is a little bit of uh, techn uh, technicality. Also the encoding instantiation that uh, we present in our paper, there is uh, one for Z2 to the K. I will not enter into details now, like it's a lot of text in the slide and I'm running out of time. Um, uh, this is can, important. Can you just answer to... uh, what the constraints on D here are though? Um, can, can D be anything? Uh, any D... positive integer? Yes, D is the degree of the polynomials that come from, that are somehow related to the computation we want to prove. So it I depends see. on which D you, I hope I don't have conflict in notations. Yeah, D, no, just, just on the slide. Yeah, D is the degree of, of the QRP exactly as uh, in the QAP world. Got it. Okay, great. So another thing that, another in, uh, instantiation for encodings that has a nice application, um, it's this for rings that look like that, or like that, sorry, there is an inconsistency. R here should be H. Um, and here the exceptional set, it's, um, it's exactly the ZP1, where P1 is the smallest prime in the decomposition of this cube which doesn't have to be prime. Okay, and this uh, addresses a little bit the same problem of uh, the previous uh, result of uh, uh, Fiore and all, uh, which also constructs uh, snarks for this kind of rings, but with Q prime. So we go one, one step further and uh, this un unlocks so many more application and optimization in the FHE, uh, in this uh, verifiable computational encrypted data um, uh, uh, application use case uh, because all the ciphertext in LWE, ring LWE, are, uh, are of this form and in this space. Okay, so like time for conclusions. Um, so quadratic uh, programs and uh, snarks over fields are a super useful tool in the community. There are super many implementation. I'm not really aware of if there are efforts to go to a standard even in, in defining the QAP, for example. But if there are, I, I think it's very important to take into account that at some point in maybe not this work, which is we don't have an implementation. It's more like a theory first step to, to snarks over rings. But um, maybe it's nice to have in mind when, when we standardize the progress that will happen in the future. I don't know, like that's, that's my view. Maybe it's very naive. Uh, so in this work, we are just pointing out like how it will look that the framework which con is constructing uh, snarks over rings and also embeds like uh, recovers all the other snarks on, uh, on structures that are rings like fields. And uh, we stress out what are the modification to, to make to, to the previous work in order to make it work for rings. Okay, so some open questions, but I think there are many. Um, it's like uh, going to more complicated structure, non-commutative rings and um, other encodings like making publicly verifiable snarks, uh, which for some rings may work. I, it, it's an open question. So thanks, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions and have a discussion. Thank you so much, Anka, for the presentation. <clears throat> um, let's uh, open up the floor. Who has any questions? I know there's been some movement in the chat, uh, some questions and answers, but if anybody feels like their question wasn't really answered, you can also uh, just unmute and, and ask. Uh, um, maybe it would be good to ask my um, question about um, why it's designated verifier only here, because I, I'm so yeah. you you can have pairings over rings, but I I don't think they've been studied as um, thoroughly. Can, and I don't know whether on, that's what you need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's a great question. Like you can, but not over any ring. So we give a little bit. Like we, we wanted to keep it generic. Of course, the framework 
will embed also the, the publicly verifiable one, but the instantiation for our encodings are encryption schemes, which need secret key for, for doing the quadratic check. So that's the reason. But I agree that may there may be some composite order groups for which we have pairings. And we it, it's an interesting problem to look at it. Did you come oh, so, across so carry on, Mary. Did you come across any um problems which if you were to represent them in exactly the same way as were they represented in the prime field in um the in the ring field where it wouldn't be secure? Mm, like for, for example, the soundness of our QRP, like if we just uh, sample random to interpolate polynomials from, from the entire ring, then we will lose soundness. It will be the case that, yeah, we can get the polynomials to verify the final equation to, to, to be a solution to the QRP, but not a solution to the computation itself. Uh, I think most of the problems are, are uh, where most of the modification we need to make and uh, the challenging facts were because soundness or because the structure doesn't allow us for the, the soundness to hold in the same way as for the fields we need to, to look further. Okay, can you say more about the encryption? How do you instantiate that? So we just looked at known encryption schemes that work over the, the correct uh, rings. So here, for example, yeah, actually here it's not only, oh yeah, and I have a type which the same public key. So here, for example, for, um, for Z2 to the K, uh, unfortunately the exceptional set for this, uh, this ring is just, uh, just uh, two it has two elements so this will not help us much so we need to move to the galois extension which are all the elements of this form where hopefully we have an exceptional set that has size two to the d so there are two all the polynomials where ai is in zero and one here i see and we, we, we uh, it's not hopefully we do we do <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> And Wait, so how, can you clarify how the security depends on the size of the exceptional set? So, do you want to answer, Anka? Oh, uh, go on, go on. Yeah, yeah. You, are, you are the ring expert here. <laughs> yeah. um, so, if you remember, Anka talked about, yeah, exactly, this slide, the sword symbol lemma over rings, right? So, here at some point in the proof, you're going to use the sword symbol lemma somehow. And uh, you need this exceptional set to be big enough for soundness. Um, so one thing that we were discussing in the chat as well is that, okay, if you go to the extreme case, which is precisely the, the integers modulo two to the k, you would say like, oh, then I have to go to like a huge extension, right? And, and now this has the problem, like uh, you have to work over this extension and, and so on. Uh, but in the paper, we also show strategies uh, for parallel repetition. Um, so in that case, if you go that way, uh, this extension degree, which relates to the size of the exceptional set, it's going to be proportional to the size of the QRP, because you still need this exceptional set in order to have this uh, isomorphism between your constraints and your uh, quadratic ring uh, program. Uh, oh, I see. So the soundness error is um, dependent on the size of the exceptional set, but then you can run it in parallel. Yeah. Okay. I think Carla uh, has a question. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. I was thinking that, uh, so, so you're trying to do a fully non-interactive um, system. So what, what would happen if you um, considered rounds? Like, could you get rid of this designated verifier uh, restriction? You could, I, I believe there's, people doing that out there at the moment even. So you can do like a GKR kind of protocol and you can throw PH Shamir. Maybe. Ah, you just said you wanted interactive even. You were fine with interactive, right? So you can also do like some sort of uh, generalization of the GKR protocol uh, using these ideas as well. Maybe this is a stupid question, but um, <clears throat> you're saying, maybe Carla, you were implying that if right now in a non-interactive kind of by design system, 
you don't get public verifiability for whatever constraints there are with rings. Um, if you go the interactive way, but then fiat Shamir that into non-interactive, that's supposed to solve that problem. Because I mean, interactive schemes are kind of more inherently designated verifier, right? I mean, you're interacting with the verifier. You're not, um, you don't get public verifiability as a given. Or maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong in the way that I think about it, but then fiat Shamir that and you get public verifiability, that seems like a pretty easy way to solve the problem. And I mean, I'm not sure if building the interactive system is easy, but if you had it, that would be. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, I think um, Anka and Eduardo can answer better, but I know that for lattices, no, Anka had this work before where she was trying to do this for lattices and fully non-interactive was not like you, you had the same issue, right? That yeah, the instantiation of the encoding in yeah, like once. So we... so even even in the in the even in the interactive setting, you don't solve public verifiability. That's what you're saying. No, but there is there there are these like Jonathan no has these like um, lattice based uh, um, things where no like, but you get, only get square root or like I don't know. So it might be also because of uh, what's your departing point. We wanted to do like snarks, like in general. Like if you go for other things like GKR, right? You have to go for these non-uniform circuits and so on. And we wanted like something general because we wanted something. Specific. We wanted a snark. Jonathan, you were gonna say something? Yeah. So I mean, you can you can generalize stuff like um, you know discrete log interactive proofs and. Um, uh, you know, stuff like bulletproofs to um, like lattice settings to to like a large extent. Um, probably you can do the same over um, general rings as long as you have a, a suitable encryption scheme. Um, but then, you know, may, obviously the, the lattice setting is very nice because you have like um, an analog of Pedersen commitments and you can kind of, um, yeah, you can adapt a lot of details of um, uh, different interactive proof systems that you know it's, it's probably a bit more Probably a bit more tricky over over general rings, but I mean, I don't think there are any real inherent limitations to like interactive proofs and sigma protocols over over general rings. And you just need um, you need like similar um, similar conditions, like these um, challenge spaces of exceptional sets. Okay, thank you, thank you for that answer. Um, any other? question or, or, or follow-up, I mean. Yeah, so, so on concrete efficiency, it, the, I guess we're comparing to say something um, like Planck with lookups um, and you, you just do um, uh, multi-limb arithmetic in the obvious way. Um, so have you made any comparisons um, of your system with that? In terms of concrete, say prover and verifier efficiency. So I think like we we focus on on the same same flavor of snarks. Like Plonk is universal uh, snark. Like it has a different framework, and actually we don't have a practical implementation or um, or nothing close to that. But our our intuition is that the the circuit like as we as we looked at that related work where we have to do this compilation from computation over rings to, to, to the field circuit, the field arithmetics, we will not have to do this in, in, uh, in our uh, instantiations. The overhead will be in the encoding scheme we use and parallel repetition or things like that. I, I guess it's, it's too early if you don't have an implementation yeah. to estimate um, what the overhead is. Though. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I want to, I definitely was thinking about this question and, and Dara, you were kind of my candidate to, to ask about um, how kind of efficient could, you know, uh, field-based snarks be used to implement the applications that Anka was mentioning that are sort of ring uh, inherent in, in, uh, 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 in, in, right, fundamentally ring operations. Because okay. I think like yesterday, so, something like uh, like the, the talk by Joshua Barron, he was mentioning also in the Sieve program, there is people thinking about, uh, you know, neural network verification and things like this. And it seems like it could get extremely efficient. 
So, um, so we, we have thought about this problem. Um, basically, the um, so you don't so much pay for the, um, the multiplications themselves in the ring. What you pay for is the reductions. Um, they're, they're much more expensive than the, the actual multiplications. Um, and you can do delayed reduction to, um, to reduce the number of those. Um, but at, at the end of the day, you're probably going to have to do um, one reduction um, sort of each time you, you increase the um, size of the, um, the thing you're multiplying. Um, so the cost of that is basically, so if you were doing it in R1CS, um, it would be one gate per um, bit in the partial product. Um, so, so you can think about sort of probably um, two times the, um, a little bit over two times the um, size of your modulus. Um, and then when you're doing it um, in Planck with Pluckup, um, I mean, there are various trade-offs you can make, but the simplest one would just be to use a lookup table to um, decompose multiple bits at once. So suppose, for example, that you have a, um, a two to the 20 um, row circuit, um, then you can afford a 20 bit lookup table and you can decompose 20 bits at once. So you, you're, um, you're 20 times more efficient in terms of number of rows than R1CS is in gates. Now, now a row is not quite comparable to a gate, it's more expensive. Um, and then you can increase the number of columns if you want um, sort of to, to reduce that further. Um, but you're not, you're still going to, so, so consider RSA, so you need 3000 bits or more in your modulus if it's going to be secure against factoring. Um, so that's going to be 3000 um, times two probably divided by 20, which is 300 um, rows per reduction. Maybe you can increase the number of columns to reduce that further, but not by much. So factor of 300, say. Okay, call, it, call it 100 if you do, if you have some clever optimizations that I haven't thought of. That's definitely a very uh, a concrete analysis. So thanks for that. Eduardo, you have a yeah, to that? I, I didn't know uh, this uh, paper that uh, Daya was talking about. So I, I would have to check and I cannot uh, say on that. So what we compare with in the paper there's this uh, XJ snark um, paper where they discuss things like this. And actually, Anka had like a slide showing this, right? Where, where she was talking about uh, this, uh, that eventually you have to do this modular reduction, which is going to have uh, the way we thought about it because we didn't know this lookup table paper. Um, you know, a number of multiplication gates or a number of constraints there is, uh, uh, basically, the bit size of the maximum value that you can have on that wire. Um, so that's one that's one problem. Imagine if you wanted to work over the integers modulo two to a sixty four or something like that, and you are on the field that is bigger uh, for your pairings. But then there's also the other problem of uh, whether your values are bigger than what you can represent on your wires, right? And then you need to have like multiple words if you are doing something with RSA, for example, that you wanted to do some anonymous credentials or something like that. There, then, there's, a, there's actually a ticket on the Zcash repo, which, which goes into how you can efficiently do um, reduction in either, it, it's for R1CS, but the generalization to um, Planck style circuits is trivial. Um, I, I'll put that in the chat. Perfect, cool. So, and for that also, like, uh, you know, you can do like some sort of uh, Karatsuga thing and you get this complexity of, uh, O of M to the 158 or something that, that Anka showed. But I'm missing this, uh, you know, I didn't know this paper that they was talking about. So I don't know how that is. Dyer has a better picture. I yeah, I have a comment about this trade-offs. This is a trade-off with computation memory, right? Like lookup tables can be big and it's still an overhead to me. I don't know, maybe for an implementer point of view, that's, that's nice. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay. So, this, this is so, so when you're doing yeah. when you're doing the lookup tables, 
you can basically do them in parallel with the rest of the circuit. So, so if you have a, a two to the 20 circuit, you're not paying that much extra to have a two to the 20 lookup table. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so this is definitely a very interesting question uh, in terms of the sort of motivation for actually using it, right? Um, I have a, a, a follow-up question to actually the previous point we were discussing in terms of um, the structure of the rings and stuff. How close can these assumptions that are derived from, from sort of the rings and, and essential sets and stuff, how close are they to ring LWE? style assumptions um so, given that there have been also you know uh, schemes built on those kind of assumptions so i would relate them more to like the equivalent assumptions over fields and uh, so like one thing that maybe like uh, just to remind like we recover qaps from qrps if you instantiate with the field that you usually do and the same for our assumptions or QPDH assumption and our QPKE assumption. If you if you instantiate with the field that you do uh, in classic snarks, you recover the original definitions. So now the quest, now these encodings, right, you can build from whichever encryption scheme. And that might be using our LWE or whatever thing else. But we that's like another step, right? Like now it's uh, how can I build this encoding? I don't know if that answers. Like you, yeah, definitely. For example, for the I mean, homomorphic encryption uh, application that we have, um, we instantiate, yeah, we, we do an encoding using learning with errors and so on. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Thanks for clarifying that. Any, any other questions or topics of discussion. Okay. I would I would ask the question now, uh, the kind of million dollar question, how do we see this topic or this um, framework as a potential standard? How much of it is worth discussing in that context? Um, maybe as part of the reference document. What do people think here? I, I mean, I definitely think that the applications um, of um, ring arithmetic are useful to discuss. And then we can we can talk about several possible ways of doing that, one of which is the, um, the pluck up approach and one of which is um, just to, to reference um, these papers. I mean, I mean, it's, it sounds like they're, they're not quite ready for prime time, but they're um, the things that might be useful to, for that application in future. I mean, in fact, we could have one of the one of the example circuits could be, say, a, a modular reduction uh, over some large ring. When it comes to standardizing a specific snark over rings, I'm not sure where they're yet, but when it comes to standardizing how do you do ring ar arithmetic, that to me sounds quite useful, as in like how do you represent the circuit. So you would say something like having a document that is a standalone document that talks about uh, snarks over rings in general, how to encode uh, these circuits on rings and things, and maybe goes through an example that compares doing that uh, circuit on a ring-based snark and a field-based snark. Because like the comparison and the trade-off is, in my opinion, one of the most important, one of the most interesting aspects of the discussion. Yeah, uh, if, that, you, if you're an implementer, you want to know do I use an existing snark or do I use something specialized? Right. Like I, I know my application is, you know, ring operation heavy. Which one do I prefer to use? And how do I go about knowing which one to use? That's more or less the question that I think that document should answer. Um, 
and then the question maybe stands is this framework appropriate the appropriate line or is that there like more generalizations or so about the snarks i agree that you know like there's I'm, I'm sure there will be more research in this topic right so that might keep changing but i am pretty confident about this uh, quadratic ring program uh, representation as it being like the right way to look at this and actually when we were preparing like uh, discussing for this talk uh, like Anka Chai and I um, so we, we show in the paper right with if you have this exceptional set um, then you can build quadratic ring programs but I'm pretty convinced this is necessary and sufficient but it's not only sufficient um, I mean we have that we are using this isomorphism all the time. And if you have, so these ideas, if you remember, were like X minus some point, and this point was in the exceptional set. So I think we can probably prove that if you have that point to not be all on the exceptional set, those ideas are not going to be co-prime. Um, but I mean, yeah, I think so. I think the worry there is just that the sort of the research in field-based knocks is I think generally moving away from QAP type abstractions to more like polynomial IOP type abstractions. Um, which I'm, I'm I'm sure like the underlying principle of these exceptional sets would be applicable in, in that as well. But I feel like QAPs up and Q, and QRPs are sort of very restricted to um these circuit specific setup kind of snarks. And I think the both uh, practice as well as uh, research is, I think, maybe not moving away from them, but like certainly exploring other, like a lot of the interest is in more of these polynomial IOP abstractions. I, I mean, I would say it was moving away from them. I think that's fair to say. No, I think. I think it's still good somehow to try and get some kind of ring awareness into um, into the standards, even if you don't exactly think that um, the QAPs are good. If you want to design like um, a polynomial IOP over over rings, and you sort of evaluate polynomials at different random challenges, um, then probably they're going to have to come from some kind of exceptional set. So um, even if even if you kind of dislike um, QRPs or QAPs or something, like um, some of the issues are going to be the same. So I think if we can if we can get some kind of general awareness out of out of this of rings, then that would be good. Yeah, for sure. Okay. And the, there was a question in the chat talking about whether this was um, important for hidden order groups or more generally for composite order groups. So, so how, how far does it generalize? So that I was think, Mary's question. Oh yeah. Uh, I think this is a matter of the application, but oh, you, you mean that do we need to know the order of the group when we construct this? Uh, do we need to know the, the yeah, exact? That, that, that's the most basic question, yeah. I see, I see. Um, let me think. Hmm. Like we need to know how to define this exceptional set, I guess. So that may be an issue, not knowing the order of the group. Do, do you have an example in mind, Eduardo, for example? Or... So we're, we're working with like a ring arithmetic, right? We have like the, the additions and the multiplications. I'm a bit confused about the question. But so if we don't know the... I know, was it you, Mary, who asked this? Uh, yes, it was. So, um... When you're thinking about RSA based groups, often you wouldn't know the order of the group. That would be the whole reason why you are using them. Um, and I wasn't really implying that we should be trying to cover such groups with that question. I was just sort of trying to sort of say, are we thinking hidden order groups or are we thinking known order but composite groups? So when we wrote this, we weren't thinking about hidden order groups. And I don't know, I don't know if Chaya maybe has a better answer or something, but I, I won't be able to answer from the top of my mind. I don't know. Well, I haven't thought about it too much, but I feel like um, 
we cannot already handle unknown order groups without without doing something more because we have to define this exceptional set so i'm not entirely sure if we can do this without knowing the order. okay i mean that makes sense in my mind it make uh, there is a lot to be said for keeping the, those two settings separate anyway i was just asking really I don't <clears throat> just one quite one thing is that in the RSA application, you don't know the order of the group, but you know the structure of the group. So you can tell if it has an exceptional set or you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, like exactly that was what I was thinking about. If we have a way to have, we don't need to know the order, but if you give me already the exceptional set when when you generate the group right when you generate everything then you trash the order uh and you give me the exceptional set together then we are able to do the 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 same the same work we did we do, don't does the, does the exceptional set leak information about the order though yeah yeah that would be not desirable right yeah i don't know like i never that, that I think it's a super interesting question to look more in uh, how to how to build these exceptional sets for unknown order groups. I, th I think kind of what would happen is that um, you could specify any set you wanted, and if you actually found an exception, um, you know, like um, a zero divisor, then you would be able to um, to factor or find the order of the group yeah. or something. Oh, I see. That that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. My ring theory is rusty. So, Jonathan, you say that uh, with uh, overwhelming uh, uh, probability, everything gets an exceptional set. Well, like I guess um, Every... you can choose. You can kind of choose whatever you want because yeah. if if you ever find if you ever find something that's not yeah. that that means it's not an exceptional set, then um, you you can solve a hard problem. So, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So um, just to kind of wrap it up, there just seems to be two or three interesting uh, points to be discussed. Now, I, I want to ask, do people think that these um, discussions are sort of mature enough? Uh, are people maybe willing to get together, whether as a working group or just as a group to kind of put some time to analyze all of these questions a little bit more and go a bit more in depth. Um, maybe as part of that group, some conclusions or summaries could be written into the reference document. Um, or again, would people just prefer to have that standalone document and we think that it's ready to be uh, worked on? So let's let's maybe ask it and uh, please answer on the chat. Uh, answer with a one if you think that it's uh, better to have it as part of the reference document, and answer as a two if you prefer having a working group and a dedicated standalone document. Please write it in the chat. Okay, I think the answer is kind of clear even before uh, everybody else uh, answered. Uh, although, of course, if you still, okay, good. Okay, um, so I will say Anka and Eduardo and uh, I think uh, Chayan is also here, but uh, yeah, Chaya. So you are, uh, would you be in charge of opening a Telegram group and uh, making sure to sort of in the coming weeks, integrate some of the feedback as a way of expanding the document a little bit and having um, the, the perspective that was discussed here in terms of the trade-offs and in terms of, of that kind of comparison. Um, and uh, the, con the discussion could be continued in the Telegram group. And then uh, we could set up another meeting again in about a few weeks time when uh, the workshop's over and so on to continue the discussion. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. Yeah. 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 Thanks. 
to, okay. So I, I'd like to suggest actually that we have um, ring arithmetic as one of the um, sort of examples that we use for benchmarking and comparison of proof systems. And, and we don't need to specify any particular approach to doing it. Um, just to include it as an example, and, and then that will tell how good any particular system is at ring arithmetic, but presumably for a specialized to a particular ring. So we allow yeah, the, a, the proof um, system designer to specify mm -hmm. the ring. Okay.